All right, here we are. Welcome back to episode 15 of the podcast. Darren looks a little bit different, a little less balding, a little less malding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and in a different location. So. I could be mad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you don't know him, then what are you doing? This is Joe Bro, our former head coach of our Rainbow Six team and currently the head analyst, which we'll get into for the yes, Sonics. Sir. And where are we? Uh, we're in Berlin. So uh, Look at that. The, the, the mumblings behind us is the uh, the crowd getting ready for the final game, FaZe versus Rogue. So Yeah, so we're recording this like two hours before the final championship games. We don't know who won yet. But by the time you watch this... I've it, seen well, the yeah. script. So Yeah, this guy knows all the numbers. So yeah, got it all um, Before we get into today's itinerary, we always got to go back and read the comments of the past podcast episode. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the first one is from Anthony J. Porras. Okay. I wonder who that could be. Yeah. He says, at least I am Mario in this agreement of overalls. Okay, so we were talking about his overalls and his fashion choices. Oh, so. okay. Anyway. Well, yeah, no one want, would want to be Luigi. I'm so. going gonna, I'm gonna to thumb down. I'm thumb down. I'm going to give that comment a thumb down. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. Maybe uh, try harder next time. Yeah, we need a funnier comment, uh, AP. Okay, next is from Bodinski, who says, let me be the new social media man. Now make sure everyone knows Everton is the biggest club in Liverpool. Okay. Well, you, you are hiring for a social media We are media hiring. Guy, right? And I could care less about Everton versus Liverpool. Oh, so he missed, he missed out then. <laughs> but you will please uh, our CEO with that comment. So we'll, we'll consider it. He's got to get to the interview with the CEO, yep. though. So he has to go through you. True. True. Uh, next is from Calfi, who, as always, has something negative to say about the podcast. Yeah, because you're on it. Yeah. Uh, she says, expletive. It's been a while since the last podcast episode, mm -hmm. which is not true. And she realizes this and says, been so long without one, I didn't even notice episode 13. Hope next one is in a week, not two. Yeah. All right. Which is it. it, it this should be within a week. Perfect, so, perfect. Yep. It will be eating your own words. And then Mr. Solo Q leaves a comment that they leave on every single video that says, sheesh. So there you go. I want to give you guys like a, I'm going to give you, you guys are going to see minus on these comments. These are these are rough. Uh, so yeah, do better next time. Leave some funny comments and we'll read them for the next episode. So um, so this this episode is going to be a little bit different. I think usually we go through like all the teams and what's going on with our teams and stuff. And this time, since nothing's really happening outside of Rainbow Six, we just wrapped up the major. Um, since you're a Rainbow Six specialist, I think we'll just focus on the Rainbow Six team. Focus kind of on your career in esports. Get the the origin story of of Joe Bro. Yeah. Um, and just kind of go from there. So, with that said, I think we'll start with how did you get into esports and why did you join the Sonics? Yeah. So uh, I was a uh, engineer by trade, and then also kind of before I moved into uh, the Sonics full time, I was working as a, uh, a product or a project manager. Yeah. Uh, so basically what that means, it's uh, I was uh, managing a team of engineers to get stuff done, basically. And by uh, engineers, you don't mean like building buildings or like building like. No, software. I mean, I, I mean, like the nerdy kind, like the, <laughs> uh, like the software engineers, people who yeah. sit at product computers. So it was basically the same thing as, as now working with with pro gamers, because, I mean, software engineers have kind of the same temperament as pro gamers and they have uh -huh. the same level of uh, like knowledge base and expertise yeah. in their fields. So. Uh, for me, that was really helpful in kind of leveraging that experience. But to kind of like go before that, I, I was working full time as a as a pro uh, project manager after just shifting out of my software engineering quality assurance uh, role at a previous job. And uh, I saw the Sonics were hi are hiring or looking for someone. And the prior year, I had been working on my own stuff. I had mm -hmm. been uh, creating statistics. I had started working at SiegeGG. I had uh, developed with a friend of mine, Kander, a uh, fantasy rainbow uh, sports league that you can draft players and yeah. compete against your friends. So I was doing things with statistics that uh, other people hadn't been doing. And I had uh, tried out for a couple other teams, but I didn't get very far. I, I got no response back. So I had tried out for two T1 teams uh, and didn't get any response back because I wasn't ready yet. And also, te most teams weren't looking for statistics. Sure. And then when the science gig rolled around, I had uh, a platform that I was I was working on and I went through multiple different rounds of just back and forth with Super uh, and 
what he needed versus what I could offer. And I ripped my own system apart twice, I think, in order to, to meet the needs that he wanted. And so then I got that role and I kind of outlined my plan for him. I was like, I I'm, I'm, want to be an analyst now, but I would love to be able to come in and work with the team full time. And that was prior to our, our 2020 season. Yeah. So at the end of 2019, uh, we went to USN with uh, our roster then, which was uh, Super, Goddess, Gumpy, Slebin, and I, I forget, uh, Nep. Nep, yeah. um, And so that was our roster for, for USN. So we made it uh, out of, we were top eight, and then we moved into, I think, top four, and I think we got smoked. Um, <laughs> so I think we had to, we beat Tempo Storm or something. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So, you know, we, that, was a, that was our our gift to the world, is beating Tempo Storm. Yeah. And... Uh, after that, then we, we made some roster changes and we went into the new, the 2020 season, which was, we had been relegated before and then we got invited back into the league. And so then I moved to Harrisburg uh, to, to be with the team full time, to be the, the coach and analyst. And so that's kind of how I got my start. And um, it was definitely uh, a transition. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Darren had some words to say <laughs> about me, me going from, you know, a full time yeah. engineering salary to a, uh, to an esports salary, <laughs> e -sports, yeah. but uh, I had planned it out and I was able to figure out how I could make it work. And I kind of estimated like uh, two years or so that I could be be at that before I would have to, you know, either either move on or hopefully get bumped up. And yeah. now here we are, two years later, and uh, now I'm the the lead analyst for the for the org. So learning the other games. We kind of talked about it a little bit last night over dinner. Um, you know why? Why was esports an appeal to you? Like you were working, you were already working in in your industry and in, in engineering. Yeah. Um, with what I assume was a pretty nice job, mm -hmm. stable income, and now you're going to enter esports, which is like the exact opposite: unstable <laughs> job. The yeah. pay isn't comparable to like a you know a professional like software engineer might make. Mm -hmm. um, what was like your motivation to, to make that change? Yeah, um, I, I don't remember which coach or, or whoever, but they ended up getting fired or something from one of their jobs. It was either uh, in NA or in EU. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, you know, I could I could do that. Because they had put something on Reddit or something and they were talking about it. Um, and I was like, wait, I can I do all those things already with my with my engineering teams mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm trained in this. And I have I have a back a, a really strange background, not only in engineering, but uh, a lot of hobbyist improv and acting in the, in my past. That's kind of helped form and shape my uh, understanding of how teams operate and how to help teams along and help craft successful teams. And so for me, I, it was like I, I I can I can do this. Um, and I had been playing Siege since beta, so I was highly passionate about the game, and I still am. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, I don't have the experience of a T2 coach or you know a, a T1 coach, but do do I necessarily need that if I can translate that and I can help an org or a team understand that that translates from one position to another in, in certain fields? And so obviously the first two times that I tried it, it didn't really work out. People were just like, no, this guy doesn't have any experience, whatever, he's mm -hmm. not going to be useful. Um, but I think uh, especially Super, he, he, he appreciated that from my resume too because he also has a, he has a degree. He has an understanding. Right. He's a little. He was further along in you know in life compared to most other esports players and, and, and teams. So he had that kind of grander perspective on and you know what he needed in order to round out the team uh, rather than just providing him the same perspective. So for me, I was like, I know I can do this. Mm -hmm. um, when it was at the start uh, or at the end of 2019, I gave myself basically all of 2020. I said I'm going to do this for a year. If I can't get onto a T1 team, I'm not gonna, I'll just stop at the end of 2020. Yeah. So I started the December of 2019, it was Christmas. I was working working my ass off, uh, trying to get the first uh, <laughs> trial for, for the T1 team. And I was home for the holidays with my brothers and my mom. And they were all just like, oh, celebrate with us. You know, let's go out and we're- so I can't, I'm VOD reviewing. You no, know, I was like, and I was, I was, I was sitting down and I was VOD reviewing yeah. and I was typing up uh, documents and uh, making charts, you know, I really wanted to see if I can, you know, at least get some feedback. So what did, what did your family think when they saw you, like, making this career change? Did, did they understand it at all? Did they think you were uh, crazy? My, my family and my friends, so my, my mom told me it was never going to happen because yeah. my mom's my number one critic. Uh, yeah. And she likes, to be, she likes to try and, like, keep my he head level. Yeah. Um, so every time I do something like this, this is this, probably the second or third time where she said, it's okay if you don't get this. Yeah. Um, I'm like, well, now I got to get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, and then I had a friend 
Um, and uh, he, he said I, I, had, I had no chance, no chance of getting mm -hmm. it. In fact, I think his words were, uh, I pinned the comment in Discord because really? it was just so funny. <laughs> and every once in a while I look at it because I'm just like, uh, 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 and uh, he said, he's like, if I had the choice between a, a guy who's good at spreadsheets and Brett Favre to coach my team, I'm always going to pick Brett Favre. I don't think Brett Favre exists in esports, though. <laughs> right, That's right. Thing. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and, uh, you know, it was it was like a, a year or two after I had I'd yeah. gotten the gig and I, I brought that up to him. And he's like, I would still pick Brett Favre. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, come on, man. Like, give me, give me some credit. Yeah. Um, so that's like my nut. That's my like top one motivating like Discord comment ever. It was just like, hey, you're never gonna get this, yeah. and I'm just like, I will prove you wrong. Yeah. Was, you know, for me, like, uh, I just need like a little bit of like that, um, like a little bit of that edge or something. Like, people are gonna make fun of me or whatever, right? But like, uh, even my mom was like, you know, it's okay if you don't get it. But for yeah. me, it's like, okay, well, I know I can. Um, and uh, to to her credit, my mom would ask me, she'd be like, hey, well, what's your percentage chance of getting this and i'd be like it's probably a point one and then i would oh. get that first i got that first interview or you know pass so that first step. now we're at five percent <laughs> and that's what i did i was like yeah. i'm probably around five percent um because there were probably you know 20 or 30 other people that they were looking at yeah. at, the, at the time and and then after i got the past the second one i'm like well that probably jumped up to like 60 70 percent right. now i'm probably on like the final final four or something like that and then uh, i got the email from from super and it said you're the person i've elected to hire and i was just like <laughs> I'm in. So, yeah. but then I had some real, very real questions to answer because, like to your uh, point before, do like how do I make this transition from my salary before, which was you know twice as much as I was going right. to be making in esports, and uh, I looked at my my expenses, and you know I'm I'm a little older, so I have to pay for like health insurance, I have a car, you know stuff like that. The fun expenses. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. the stuff that you have you can't get away from once you pass 26. Yeah. Um, I'm getting close to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's all downhill after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I looked at my expenses, and I, I'm very fortunate. I, I did, I do have loans for like school and stuff, but I had saved up some money. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than just dumping it all into my loans, I had saved some up, and I said, you know, I can invest in myself over the next two years, and I can kind of cover that gap. Yeah. To make this work, and then by the end of two years, hopefully, I'll be be able to make more money. Um, and a lot of people don't have that opportunity, so they kind of they'll either burn out or they need to ask and for I, more money. And I feel like a lot of people like don't have like the self control to say I might be operating at a loss for like two years, mm -hmm. but in the long run, if I make it, I'm gonna be breaking even. And I'm gonna be making similar, you know, similar salary to what I once was. Yeah, and now I'm now I'm right back up to where I right. was before. So um, for me, it was just being able to make sure it's like, okay, well, I need to be able to be on budget here. I can't, you know, go out and make some crazy, uh, purchases. Now, granted in the middle of that, I had some leeway even still to, uh, purchase a new computer because my old computer was yeah. crapping out. Um, so I still had a good amount of money to buy a nice top of the end computer in that like range and right. still make it last for two years. I think I ended up investing probably like around $12,000 of my own money to be able to bridge that gap be able to make it work to mm -hmm. get to where I am now. And I mean, I get to do all this cool stuff now. So um, there's definitely that sacrifice, uh, not only just in terms of your time and yeah. uh, effort, but also, you know, you got to put a little bit of your own skin in the game and not be afraid of that. And I, again, I'm very fortunate. I know a lot of people don't have $12,000 over the course of two years to be able right. to, you know, burn through. But uh, for me, I had I had that opportunity, and so I said I can make this work, um, and uh, so far so good. <laughs> Here we are. But yeah, um, yeah, I, you know, I I knew, I knew I could do it. Uh, I was highly motivated by people uh, like Shas, like mm. Jess, um, because I had seen what they were like posting and and, and how they would coach, I, and it was like okay, I can I can do this too. Okay, so what? How can how does this relate into my experience? Uh, and, and even one of the uh, conversations I was having last night with somebody over a drink, it was we were just talking about the uh, the differences in siege, and w he was comparing uh, how you know he's he was he's in a, like he was a, in, a, in a band and how they would do like their improvisational like music sessions in order oh, okay. to figure out yeah. what their what their sound was, hmm. and they would just pass things around. I'm like, well, that's kind of how my coaching style was because I've done improv and acting in the past. Um, and that's was a part of me is like I wanted five people who would communicate and have that kind of 
music sound and <clears throat> be able to work off of each other and, and find those opportunities. And I think that's what we did really well in, in 2021 is we had five players who were willing to communicate with each other and make that music together yeah. and find those opportunities. So there's a lot of cool things from different, and, and this kind of goes back and harkens back into, and in my experience, it was an esports experience, but it was improv, it was acting, it was uh, engineering experience and all of that formed how I could bring that into esports because I could lens it through uh, to esports and make it relevant to a player. Yeah. So I think that's the hardest part sometimes is how do you bring all this different experience and, and make lens it, it yeah, for a player who just plays the game all the time and, and is really only interested and has the attention span for one thing. Yeah. So you have to be able to translate that in your brain and, and speak their language. I wanted to hear a little bit more about kind of your coaching philosophy. I know you're not really in a coaching role anymore, mm -hmm. but because I feel like when, when I hear the word like esports coach, I think people have take like make two assumptions either one i feel like somebody who's not as familiar with how esports coaches work might think of them more of like a traditional coach it's who not is that. It's right like a dad right who's <laughs> coming up with like the plays and setting like the daily schedules and you know they're the one who's controlling what the team's doing in the game and then the second the second opinion that i feel like a lot of people take and this might be from people who have a little bit more experience with esports is that it's more of like a man management role mm -hmm. it's like a glorified man management role your primary responsibility is managing the team, managing the personalities on the team. Mm -hmm. And then second to that is kind of what they do in the game. So yeah. I wondered in that spectrum, kind of where did you fall mm -hmm. adding on to like the analytical side that you also brought to the role? Yeah, so I kind of, I, I, I had to wear all three hats. Oh, they're, um, they're clapping for you. <laughs> Good job, Joe. <laughs> I have no idea what they're clapping for, but. <laughs> Uh, probably talent, yeah. walking past him or something. You know, people more talented than me. So. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I kind of, I had to wear all, all three hats, a, a lot of it, especially like in the house in Vegas, because yeah. they manage the house. Um, but uh, in terms of that, so manager, analyst, coach, um, I would use, I would lens a lot of it through statistics in terms of like mm -hmm. how we would talk about stuff. And I think my style was to complement uh, super style, which was, very much in-game focus and working on strats and stuff like that. So he handled like the core strat yeah. creation. And, you know, when he needed, I would provide in feedback. You know, he would ask me, you know, what are the percentages on operators or things like that? Or what's our rating on ops? And he would tweak it from there. So um, me taking on and coming in from a analyst and a, uh, you know, like a people management person, I think that took the load off of him in order to focus on what he was really passionate about and mm -hmm. what he wanted to do. Um, so for me, I'm kind of like, uh, I, I'll, I'll do whatever. I don't care. Like I'm a support. Um, and so for me, that was focusing in on the analytics and, and, the, and the management. So my style, I would say, is kind of um, I my piece of the puzzle that I wanted to bring in when I was pitching kind of like what we were looking for during our 2021 rebuild was I, I wanted at the core uh, five good communicators because mm. that's the way like even even before attack or repick you needed people who were able to problem solve really well on the fly yeah. um, and were able to take a core idea and be able to riff off of it, make that music or improv off of it and find those opportunities. And with the United guys, we were able to bring in five or four guys who were very, uh, very communicative uh, and wanted to be a part of something as a, as a whole. And they had shown great improvement from when they started to when they ended. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the org had to let him go. Um, but for us, we, you know, that was a good core to bring in and to say, here's what, you know, here's what our perspective is that Seth and I had talked about and what we wanted in order to build this team. And, and we wanted to see gradual improvement. So for me, it was all about communication and coordination because it doesn't matter what you do, at least in terms of what I was looking for. Yeah, I don't care what you do because I'm going to learn as much from you guys as you know, you're going to hopefully learn from me. Mm -hmm. And so let's figure it out. You know, if we make that mistake, let's say, okay, well, we made that mistake. What did we learn from it? And be able to have like that retrospective approach to it where we'd be like, okay, well, you know, we tried this, it didn't work, but here's how we can build off of that and, and go from there. And so uh, for me, I, it, it's like any relationship, even, you know, whether it's, you know, romantic or platonic, yeah. if you have good communication skills, and these are young kids who maybe don't have that, you know, opportunity to be a part of that group and learn that, camaraderie aspect if you can build those strong communication skills 
a lot of the small problems that you have don't grow into big problems. Hmm. And even if you do have a big problem, they can solve it. Um, so for me, it was about enabling that communication, making sure the environment was right, people felt safe um, and wanted to contribute. Because I think, I think that is what drove us is everyone, once we had that first step of success, they were like, holy, holy shit, this actually works. Yeah. Um, and everybody wanted to contribute more and more after that. And it's not to say that we didn't have our bumps in the road, but we definitely were able to overcome a lot of things that you know other rosters weren't to make us one of the, the, the most consistent team in North America last year. So, interesting, man. This is like life advice with Joe. Well, it, and, and <laughs> I, but I think that's that's the key because a lot of these a lot of these esports players, you know, Seth excluded, <laughs> the he's, he's the got boomer. all the experience. Yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of these guys are not older than 22, 23. Yeah. And they haven't had a chance to go to college. You know, maybe they just have, you know, a high school education. Uh, and maybe, you know, they haven't, they probably haven't done team sports. They haven't, uh, they probably haven't competed in anything, you know, in an ensemble like I did. I was in a uh, competitive show choir for, yeah. for two years in high school and we won a national championship. Dang, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, so yeah, so there, <laughs> there you go. So my, yeah. my NAL win was my second national wow. championship win. <laughs> oh, um, and so, um, yeah, like uh, people don't have that level of coaching or that level yeah. of ensemble experience. They don't know how to be coached. They don't know how to be a good teammate. They don't know how to communicate. Maybe they haven't had a relationship before, so they really don't know how to communicate. They haven't <laughs> gone through those troubles. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they sit in front of a computer all day and that's that's what they're good at. They, they click heads. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, clicking heads is, you know, 50% of the job. The other 50% is... How do you communicate? How do you work with your teammates to solve problems? And so um, being able to provide that environment for players to be able to, to find that um, is, is uh, it, it's difficult because our, our 2020 roster, granted, I was just stepping in, so I wasn't quite as sure-footed as I was going into yeah. 2021. Um, but I, I struggled a lot with how to you know, nurture that environment with, with those players. Um, and it's not to say the players you know, are, you know, they were the problem because that's not true. Right. Um, I, I failed to reach them. Um, I didn't know how to get them to buy into what I felt was important. And so uh, by the end of the 2021 year uh, or 2020 year, yeah, we had to let them go. And then we were looking for other options. And so that's why right off the rip in 2021, I was like, oh, yeah, I failed at this. Uh, so let's right off the rip. Let's get these guys on board, have them buy in and, and see what good that does us. And I was pretty confident that was going to work. <clears throat> How did you, you know, kind of as a newer coach in Rainbow Six Siege, you didn't really have the pedigree of some of the other coaches. How did you gain like the respect of the player? So when it came, you know, time to have those difficult conversations, they would listen to you, mm -hmm. respect you, and want to kind of pursue that that overall vision you had for the team. And when it came to like communication and, and teamwork and team building, yeah, I, I think a, a lot of it. Uh, is uh, I, I wasn't too afraid to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes I would just, I'd say, hey, you know, this is probably wrong, but let's have a conversation about it. And I would just say it. Yeah. And then they would give me, <laughs> they'd be like, that's not right. I was like, yeah. tell, tell me, let's, let's, let's tell me what's not right. Um, and for me, and this is kind of gonna be how I leverage this with, with the Valorant and the other rosters, like as they yeah. start to get the statistics, is I'll just say, here's a bunch of numbers. Tell me what's useless. Yeah. And I feel like that's really powerful because, you know, esports players, well, they have no problem telling you when you're wrong. <laughs> What's used to yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you're able to take that and say, OK, it's not a personal slight against me. This is they're telling me this because they want they want to help. And, sure. you know, their perspective may be on a little negative side, but <laughs> um, that's just how they've you know learned to shape their shape their comments, maybe. And so I have to be able to take that and say, OK, if I do this, is this more helpful? Would this X or Y be better? They say X, then I go into X, and then I develop that a little bit, and I and, I, yeah. and then I would work on that. So with the Rainbow guys, especially uh, coming into 2020, um, I would get a lot of feedback from those guys, the old the old roster. <laughs> I'm um, sure you did, yeah, because uh, yeah, uh, I wasn't, I was definitely not, you know, as good as I was going into 2021, uh -huh. and I was I was still learning in 2021 for sure, um, and I'm very thankful for that roster being able to help me as much as they did. Yeah, um, but you know. I, I think the big part of it is you as a coach have to feel safe with the org um, and in order to do that, because mm. I didn't have the pressure on me to be the person coming in and be like the strat guy, you know, having to know everything right. about the game. I was very passionate about the game. I knew all the basics, I had everything down, 
I didn't know every single strat, but I knew every team, you know, how, how to document that kind of stuff. Yeah. And for me coming in with no experience, I think that was super helpful because I had no pressure on me in that regard because I had Seth. I could lean on him for all of the in-game mastery mm -hmm. and I just had to handle everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, Darren didn't put that pressure on me ever to, you know, be, be that person, to be the one creating the strats or, you know, being the person in game to say that this is what we're going to do. Right. Um, I just had to be the person who was going to enable that conversation to make sure it was happening. Um, and I felt that that was really powerful for me because I didn't have to do something where I felt I wouldn't, I didn't have that level of imposter syndrome. Sure. I, I was enabled to do what I was good at and in order to, in an in assisting capacity in some regard in game. So, uh, and I definitely got better and, you know, by the end of it, you know, I probably, I probably could have kept coaching if, you know, my financial situation or like my opportunities were different. Yeah. Um, but I had the opportunity to move into the head analyst spot and I was like, this is the perfect time. This is right how I had scheduled it. So, and, and I'm very fortunate that I can schedule things in my mind <laughs> and it happens. Yeah, um, not every, yeah, not everybody gets that lucky, yeah. Right, well, and, and yeah, I think uh, people don't like to think in like terms of years. Yeah. And so for me, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be 31 in November. So like I'm <laughs> old, so maybe, maybe I'm a little slow on the roll right. there because I don't like force, I don't ram things through, but I let things happen in their natural time. And yes, I am older, but I'm getting to where I wanna go in the time frame that I'm setting because I kind of understand that intuitively, I understand how long things like that take sure. and how, uh, how to roll things through in, in, in that time frame. So yeah, I, I, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to move into this position because I was like, okay, this is kind of coming to my time as an end as a coach. I still love coaching and I still could do it, but this is now my time to move into this and still, I, I will love this and I will do this, you know, for as long as I need to. Real quick, before we kind of shift into the head analytical side of things, yeah. um, my question, you know, when when you entered the role, you had a very heavy, like, you brought a lot of analytical knowledge to the role as, as the coach. Mm -hmm. um, not not so much in other esports, but specifically in Siege, was that something that was lacking in, like, the coaching position that, you know, an analytical side mm -hmm. wasn't really present in coaching, um, whether it's from the head coach, assistant coaches, or mm -hmm. just in the team? Yeah, I, I, don't, I hadn't seen, and this was why I was kind of leaning yeah. into the statistical side, is because I hadn't seen a whole lot of statistical approaches to uh, being an assistant coach, a coach, an analyst, or whatnot. It was more like strats or like team, like team mm. work as a, as an analyst. Um, and, and not to say that that's not viable, but that wasn't, <clears throat> that wasn't going to be my strength. Yeah. So when I was looking at it from a, uh, like a, like a cost, like a, like an, an ROI perspective almost, I w I looked at it when I was first starting out, I was like, what's going to be something that I can do really well. That's going to set me apart from the crowd. Mm. Um, and I looked at it and I was like, I can't be a strat analyst or whatnot because those are a dime a dozen. Everybody yeah. wants to do that. Um, and there's no, there's no additional perspective about that. You're, you, you will document something and if it, you know, you'll, you'll provide it and you know, the team will look at it and they can say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Um, but at least with statistics and numbers and stuff, they can say yes or no to your interpretation, but they can't say yes or no to the hard numbers. Yeah. yeah. So that for me, I was like, okay, well, how, how come this hasn't had as much of a, like a deep dive? Now there, there, there definitely were coaches and analysts that were doing like the, 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 the baseline statistics, but for the most part, they weren't developing their own rating because Siege GG had that. Yeah. They weren't looking at different values to kind of be competitive in that space. Um, and I knew the pros for one didn't really like Siege GG's rating. Sorry, Siege GG. <laughs> um, but um, when I was working as, as a part of the uh, part of Siege GG as well, I, I was like, well, how do we get the pros more on board with yeah. with the, with that rating? Um, and they were, they liked their rating, so and, and it worked for them. Uh, and in, to their defense, that rating is a really good moniker for all audiences. It's a very mm. general moniker and. Uh, anybody who's not familiar with the esports scene can look at that number and be like, oh, this is a green 1.3, this is a 0 0.6. I can see the difference yeah, between the impact yeah. Yeah, of, of the players. Um, but for me, I wanted to try and see how could we develop more of a rating system and things like that. My first rating systems were okay. Yeah. And then when I got Seth's feedback into it and, and how what he thought was important, 
I was able to rapidly iterate on that formula mm -hmm. and be able to create something. Um, so you got the secret recipe. Yeah. I, you got I, the sauce. I, I, I have the Diet Coke recipe. Man, so, you, man so your laptop's worth some money. Yeah. We're so going to have to get that thing encrypted. People are asking what's in the notebook. That's that, Those That's are the secrets it. in the notebook. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I've seen his notebook this week. You can't gleam any information for that notebook. It's like hieroglyphics. It, it, it literally is <laughs> random numbers and words. I don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. um, this might be more of like a Seth question, but when it came to like building strats and like team strategy or plays, whatever, how did you guys approach? Was it first you looked at the analytics and were like, okay, let's build something around the analytics? Or was it like, yeah. here's an idea. How can we fit the analytics in to mm -hmm. make it work? you yeah. know, based off the numbers. It was kind of like a, a little bit of both. Sometimes Seth would come up with a strat and then ask for my feedback into it from a, like an op perspective, like what yeah. would round this out. Um, and sometimes he would ask me ahead of time and say, you know, what ops are we gonna be good at? And then he would kind of visualize how long those ops would take for setup and try to give it an initial setup. And then we would go into scrims and try it. So, mm -hmm. um, but there was like a lot of that bounce back and forth between, you know, oh, you know, Pablo's got a, a 0.6 on this operator, but on this site, he has a, you know, a 0.9 yeah. when he plays this other operator. It's like 0.9 is still technically below average, but yeah. that's a 0.3 bump, right? So by, by being able to identify with those operators what might help in those situations based on what they're experiencing in game, that was over like a larger sample size. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to mitigate potential issues before they happen because we could remove those operators and give the players more agency on, on an operator that they probably liked more mm. um, and were able to do more on than having them play something that might have been theoretically better for the strat, but for yeah. our players, it wasn't quite translating. Mm. So I think we were able to navigate that perspective just looking at the numbers um, and say, okay, well, if we give them this bump, what happens? Do we see an improvement? You know, and that was kind of, it was like an unspoken hypothesis. It's like, yeah. if we give them this, we should see this. Um, and mo more often than not, it bumped us in the right direction and gave us a positive result. Uh, and a lot of people say, oh, the stats are just whatever, you know, you can't really tell too much about, about stats and whatnot. But uh, to us, that's like 50% of the story potentially, at most. It's not gonna be more than 50% because you still have the people side to yeah. the equation, right? But if we can mitigate that before, you know, a player brings that up, they might say, I'm uncomfortable with this. And then by then, maybe we've been running that too late, right? But if we can say, hey, you know, we've seen that you have a performance on this, we're gonna give you the opportunity to play on this operator, they're gonna be like, okay, cool. And then they go and they do it and they don't have a problem. And we've solved that problem before they even knew they had it, essentially. Hmm. Um, and I think that's the, the great strength of statistics is it tells you things before, you know, there's like maybe like an, a, a gut feeling in, yeah. in a player or in a team, and it helps you mitigate and work around those things. Um, so you just, you don't let those little problems become big problems, yeah. basically. Cool. Um, great. So transitioning from head coach yeah. into the head analyst. Mm -hmm. I mean, we announced that, I guess, the decision was made probably, I don't know, end of last year. That, that, that was kind of like the next step for you. It was made in, uh, we, were, we were at CES, and it was yeah. before Invitational. So I, so I, I knew like, that's where Invitational was going to be my last hurrah. Yeah. Um, so January, we kind of make that decision as an organization, you're on board with it, go to SI. After that, I think it was like March or something. You, yep. moved, you moved out to Philadelphia, left the team house um, to start, you know, the head analytical role. And since like we made the initial announcement and then since then, you know, you've been hard at work behind the scenes doing your own thing. So um, what's, you know, what's going on? What, what is that? Um, you know, to somebody who's unfamiliar with what a ha head analyst is or yeah. kind of what you're trying to build for the Sonics, you know, what's your elevator speech on, on what that might look like? Yeah, so uh, elevator speech is, uh, I, I haven't looked at my elevator speech in like a month. <laughs> um, of course he has one. <laughs> yeah, I do, I do have one. Um, so my, my elevator pitch, I think, is to, uh, um, you know, a, a, as an organization, we want to be able to uh, provide statistics and analysis to our teams in order to assist and, and enable coaches to develop their teams and players, uh, as well as additional scouting efforts. Basically what you've done for Rainbow Six Siege, mm -hmm. just for everybody across the world. Exactly, yeah. And so I think like where we're starting right now is uh, the first couple of months coming back from March where me getting that kind of initial idea of what the team was gonna look like. Yeah. And then we started hiring in June, uh, we started or we started hiring in like the end of May, early June. Yeah. Got started in early June or mid, like middle June. 
Um, and then we've been working since then, and I've been ramping up our, our we have two <coughs> data analysts, mm -hmm. uh, Emma and Mackenzie. And so they're helping me out uh, on the, the rainbow side, kind of taking off the, the load of looking at all the other regions. Yeah. Um, and then I have uh, two developers, Jordan and Jason, who are helping me on the, on the development side, because I, I, I'm so far removed from development now, I, I couldn't tell you what, what's really? left or right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're taking on that effort and we're creating like proof of concept and work with APIs and kind of generally trying to understand right now what are, you know, how we're going to hook in and provide these numbers from other games through APIs. So yeah. the big one right now is, is Valorant because from an FPS perspective, uh, that's going to be probably the next easiest one for me to pick up. Sure. And so being able to, you know, understand those stats and bring in some numbers, then be able to go to the team and, and provide that and then get that, get that rolling is, is the goal. So uh, by the end of this year, we would like to be able to support uh, one additional team. So I, I'm targeting Valorant right now. Mm -hmm. um, just to be able to have that up and running and be able to say, okay, no, now we have two teams that have this an like analytical based approach uh, and that they're both happy with. And now we can branch into other games like, uh, like Rocket League or yeah. you know, PUBG or, uh, well, now we have a Dota team. Yeah. Um, or <laughs> That's a new team. Yeah. When, you, when you saw that announcement and you heard that we were picking up the team, you're like, oh, shoot. It's I like, got uh, our team, I gotta, I gotta figure out. Why can't this be a League of Legends team, <laughs> yeah. man? Like, come on. But yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I had friends in college trying to get me to play Dota and I just really? never, never yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I maybe played three or four games and I was just like, this, this shit's way harder than, <laughs> uh, than League of Legends. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, 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 now that'll be kind of fun for me to learn, learn that. That, um, learn that game, watch it a little bit. Maybe yeah. I'll watch uh, TI a little bit. I was supposed to watch this last major or whatever, but I was just prepping for this event, so I didn't get too much time to watch it. Uh, which we didn't, we didn't do so hot. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. We'll, we, we, we might touch on that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I'm. Our big goal for the end of this year is to be able to support one additional team or yeah. be able to have a concept up that's going to allow us to be able to support that team. So. Uh, and then from there, next year, I'd like to add in two additional teams if we, if we can. So it's going to be so ramping up. What does that look like for like the coach of say the Valorant team? Yeah. So once you've completed your your proof concept and you have it finished, yeah. basically, is it going to be like a platform the coach can go to and just see a bunch of numbers? Is mm -hmm. it you know what does it look like? Um, yeah for somebody to, to use it? So right now I use Tableau for a lot of my uh, analytical pieces. Uh -huh. So uh, I provide to uh, the Rainbow team a, uh, a PDF, like quick view summary, like of stuff, uh, of stats. And then I have like a more in-depth, like you can click on things, uh, yeah. Tableau thing that they can use. Uh, so it'll probably be something similar, at least initially, um, and be able to give that to the coach and say, you have now full access to add in all, whatever permutations you want, I've set up this baseline of stats yeah. based on what you were interested in. <clears throat> if you ever think of anything, I will add things into these views that you can see and you can make those changes to. Sure. Um, and this should enable you to be able to bring this data to your team and help them improve, not just in scrims, but also preparing for matches. Or if you're scouting for players to be able to see, okay, these players are in the top XYZ of their league or in the top XYZ of ranked. Yeah. This is how we want to we want to bring these guys in for a trial or at least see how they act with the other guys. Um, so my main goal would be initially to enable the coach to do their job even better mm -hmm. um, and provide additional perspective to their players outside of just making strats or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually what, you know, kind of like, you know, the part of the five year plan is be able to have some kind of like website or something that we can use internally. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to ha have, you know, the coaches and the players can just sign into it and they can use that tool basically. Sure. And it would do the same thing as what we're providing right now via Tableau, but it would do it all just natively through, you know, um, a, a website. Um, and then maybe additionally too in the future, <laughs> maybe in the future have some other, you know, external things that, you know, fans can interact with and, and whatnot using um, our permutation of statistics without giving away like our secret formula. Sure. Uh, you know, allow people to drink Diet Coke without understanding what the formula is to the Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that, uh, that's a part of the long, long, long term plan. Cool. So I'm going to be playing like uh, fantasy draft picks of, of Rainbow Six Siege. Maybe. Or something. Yeah. 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 Maybe of, you know, Valorant or whatnot. And, yeah. You know, helping, you know, just. That's something that could be fun for the org to help drive engagement too, right? Yeah, it's like, sure. okay, we have like 
uh, a, a Sonics branded uh, fantasy experience for all of our esports teams. Like maybe we can even just have for Sonics players, and like you could even do it across different games That'd potentially, be sick. where you just say, okay, like I'm gonna draft, you know, these five Sonics players. Someone else is gonna draft five Sonics players, and we're gonna see based on their performances in the yeah. next like month or so, which which teams do better based on the players you drafted. <laughs> so you could have like you know a, a jungler from Dota, you know, playing with our entry frag from Rainbow, and then you know for wild. Tig yeah. from PUBG. Yeah. So who knows? Huh. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's definitely a lot. I, and uh, it's nice to be able to focus in on kind of like one core thing now. Like I don't have to worry about managing the house. I don't have yeah. to worry about coaching the team. So for me, it's nice to just be able to say, okay, I'm going to be focused in on an analytical perspective, and that's all I have to worry about. Sure. Um, and yeah, I, I do have a team of folks helping me out now, but it's all. It's all geared under that kind of one one banner in that sense. I do want to touch on the Rainbow Six team since you know we're here because of them. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, big changes coming for the team. Some we can't talk about yet. Some we can. Um, so I guess I'll just start with, um, you know, what was your perspective of obviously a disappointing performance in Berlin, um, but I felt like the team if if you disregard Berlin's performance, the team obviously had a much better stage two performance than stage yeah. one. Um, so, you know, what did you think of the team before Berlin, at Berlin? You know, where do they kind of stand in, in, in yeah. your mind? I think uh, the team bounced back really well from stage one. Yeah. I think they identified what was causing them issues. And it's tough going from invitational and you get two or three weeks and you're back in the stage one, you get no time to rest. Yeah. And so I, I definitely, I, I get that. I get that perspective and I get, you know, I get that level of suffering. It was tough. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, these guys definitely bounced back and we're looking, you know, a lot better in stage two. And yeah, yeah we, we, we lost to Mirage, but, you know, <laughs> Mirage, it, it happens, right? And they have our number. They have a great map pool against us just based on you know, what they like to play. And, yeah. you know, by that point in the season, their season was done. So they were just, they were looking to play spoiler <laughs> and they were, they were rearing to do that. Yeah. Uh, so any team they could make suffer, uh, they were going to make suffer. Uh, so. Uh, for us, you know, we, we turned up and we like to keep things interesting. So it was, you know, 7-5 against Parabellum, but we did it um, to get here. And so I think that was, uh, I think that was good for the team. I think they needed that. I think mm -hmm. they needed to, you know, come here and remember it wasn't great. Yeah. But none of our games were blowouts. Uh, That's our, true. Our, That's our true. games in, uh, you know, granted, we won our first game in Mexico against Team One, who ended up winning the whole thing eventually. Uh, but I, I don't remember what the scores of all those games were, but I remember the, uh, I think we got, was BDS in our group for that? I think we got 7-1. So, yeah. yeah, we got 7-1 by them on Consulate. Uh, so that, those were blowouts, right? Yeah. And then we had something similar when we were in Galva, uh, Sweden, where I think the first day we got 7 2 both games. Like, and we just did not look good whatsoever. Yeah. But these, uh, these guys, I think they needed to come here and remember what that was, what was that like to travel to an event and get prepared and what, what preparation needs to go into it um, in order to be here and compete at these events. And even so, in coming here, we didn't we didn't have any games where we were blown out. We yeah. you know, we lost all of them except for the phase game, which we just played loose and had fun. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we made space. We had a little bit of that Knicks inside of us. Where yeah, we, we, a little we Mirage like, moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we were like, we're going to make these guys suffer. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we, we, we blew out their mental. Yeah. Um, they got 7 0 by G2 the next game for G2 today, first in the groups. Um, so maybe we did phase a favor because they're in the finals. Now, now here. here they yeah. are. Yeah. So maybe we, maybe we helped them out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we just unleashed our inner Knicks and, you know, threw them for a loop and just had fun. You know, I, I think that's the key thing is we, we enjoyed playing that game and we were amped up for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other five games, we just had a lot of pressure on ourselves. To, to perform and, and make this a grand event for, for Seth's final performance. And uh, unfortunately, it, it didn't work out. But again, none of the games were bad. They were all close. 7-4 was the worst loss we had. Yeah. So we had two overtime losses, 8-6, and then we had a 7-5 loss. So those games still looked competitive, um, even though we, were, you know, we weren't quite you know, ready for coming into this so. i remember I, it might have been the first sandbox game but i felt like they had like three like 1v3 1v4 like clutches yeah like i remember there's one like 1v3 post plant ace clutch 
to take yeah. around. Like, what is it? Like, how is this happening? Yeah. Like, and I, I think that's just it. I think we had to come here and remember yeah. what that international competition felt like. And now we're going to take that back and we'll come stronger for stage three. Sure. So stage three, the team's going to look different. Um, obviously, Seth retiring, mm -hmm. moving into the general manager position. Um, how do you think the team's going to adapt to losing Seth, who's been there since since day one? Yeah, I, I think they'll be all right. I think uh, for Seth, I mean, it, it's 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 no mystery, you know, that he said he wanted to move on and he was yeah. he was ready to move on, right? So, I, I think for for everybody else, I think this is now the opportunity for them to step up and and take over that mantle. And the game right now is at a at a wonderful spot, especially on attack, to be able to have that high collaboration between five like playmaking shot callers uh -huh. um, where you don't necessarily need a strong core IGL person. You're still going to need someone who can kind of herd the cats a little bit sure. and say, okay, I'm hearing a lot of ideas. Here's what we're going to do. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Yeah. You're still going to need someone to do that, but <clears throat> it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a person calling the shots initially or saying, here's the take we're going to do or whatnot. The team's going to have uh, a great, especially after the last two, like year now, you know, it's gonna be you know, a year and a half, basically. Mm -hmm. They have an idea of what, you know, what it takes to win, where they need to go on maps and, and what's expected of them in those, in those positions and roles. So it's gonna be just more of that, but now giving them more of that autonomy to be able to say, okay, we're, I'm gonna make this call, everybody, we're gonna wrangle around this, and then we're gonna go. Yeah. So I think uh, we're enabling all the other players to step up and, 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 and take that ownership, which I think is gonna, it's going to probably take some getting used to, and there's not, it's not going to be without bumps, but I think they're ready for that. And I think uh, them having that level of ownership over what's going to happen as, as a group of five is going to be huge. And I mean, they don't really have a whole lot of time to, to gel because with stage three, there's a lot of pressure of, of a good performance or else they're going to miss SI. Yeah, that's true. Um, so the pressure is definitely you know, going to be in the back of their minds yeah. for sure. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, if they're having if, if they're having fun, you know, it doesn't matter if they you know get fifth or you know they make it to here, uh, like the next yeah. event. Um, they're going to keep getting better. They're going to keep learning, and then hopefully we have a good chance through an LCQ at the worst case, right? Sure. Um, obviously, I hope that we make it because I like coming out at these events and seeing everybody. <laughs> um, but I think that's the uh, I think the thing is just for them to have fun. You know, this is a new experience, uh, and let's make the most of it. Has, has Seth spoken with you at all about his new role as general manager and kind of, you know, how he's feeling about that at all? Yeah, he's, he's bounced some ideas yeah. off of me and stuff like that. And I, I've given him some, uh, some, uh, some thoughts to kind of help him get started in terms yeah. of uh, how he should speak about the role. Um, but, uh, yeah, in terms of I think, he, I think he's ready for it. I think he's going to be uh, – I think he'll do a bang-up job. Uh, yeah. He's just, he's just got to be – He's got to remember that he, he's got to be nice every once in a while. <laughs> he, he can't just say you're fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've had some players from like uh, other rosters message me like Luke. I've heard Seth is going to be the next GM. Should I be scared? Yes, like, they should be. You should be smiley face. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't have to deal with you anymore doing dumb stuff. Yep. So, God forgives. Uh, Super yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to DM Seth. Well, like, uh, Seth, the players are not putting up the sponsored content on their streams. I've asked all week, go deal with that. So maybe maybe things will get done faster. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Oh, they'll get done. Yeah. <laughs> It'll get done. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that happens. Um, so yeah, big, big changes for Siege. Mm. Some of them we can't talk about yet, but. I know everything. <laughs> you know everything. Yeah. And you know everything, not just about our team. It sounds like, <laughs> sounds like every team's making yeah. big changes next year. I, I drink and I know things. Yeah. So <laughs> You have to sub to him on, on Twitch to get the leak. So. Hey, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> um, I don't stream yet, but, you know, true. I'm, I'm trying to. We'll see. Um, what about outside of head analyst? I mean, we saw you on, on the desk for NAL. You yeah. know, what, else, what else is going on for you? Well, I think that's really just the biggest thing is yeah. the, the analyst desk was a really cool opportunity. Um, and it was the hardest thing I've probably ever done. Was it I, really? I think I put a lot of pressure on myself. Well, I, I, felt I like definitely did. You you like have the perfect like background for it because you have that experience in acting and improv, mm -hmm. which takes a lot of. And you have a massive knowledge of Siege. So 
feel like that worked together really well. Yeah. And, and they just threw me in the mix. Like I had, <laughs> yeah. um, I had Jacob on one side, I had Jesse on the other. I had, I had Doa that I had to listen to. I had yeah. production in my ear. I had like two or three other cameras that I had to listen to. And that, and, and that's not easy because back in, some of you might not know this, but back in high or in college, my, my major was in sports broadcasting. So mm -hmm. I did a ton of that. Mm -hmm. And that was always for me, the hardest thing was you're balancing like who, who's talking to you in your ear and what they're saying while you're still talking and trying to get your point across. Yeah while you're tracking like which camera's live that you have to look into. Like there's like so many moving parts that you have to keep up with. And for you to step in there and do such a good job, like your first, like for us, like for me, like it took like a whole semester to not like fumble over myself, mm -hmm. you know, with, with all that was going on. But it yeah. seemed like you were, you were a natural out there. I definitely fumbled over myself. Um, I tried not to let it get to me, but I, I definitely put a lot of pressure on yeah. myself. Uh, in order to perform because I just I wanted to do it justice and yeah. um, I think I, I reached out to a couple of people I, I reached out to uh, namely fresh and uh, Jess yeah and Jess gave me a ton of feedback which was super helpful uh, because it helped me like get ready and kind of like how here's how I need to prepare here's how I need to uh, like approach it mm -hmm. and I still ended up doing like the whole kind of like wrong kind of prep like <laughs> I, I, I prepped for it like I was prepping for 10 of our team like yeah. matches yeah and the prep you, is different like the right you just don't have time for getting through all yeah. those points and so and when I got there I was just like I was super stressed I was like trying to like wrap up uh VOD review and like wrap up my points and go through my numbers and everything like that and then I would get on broadcast and I'd be like I'd I don't have time to yeah, you cover. have 30 seconds to cover this entire match. Yeah. Like. And um, for me, that was really difficult, yeah. um, but it was a great learning experience. Uh, Jesse and Jacob gave me a lot of great feedback as well. And Taro and Pengu gave me great feedback, Blue and Stokes. Um, and then Adam and Jasmine, the producers too, they all Man, helped you, me. you had the whole the whole team there. That's, it takes, it takes a village, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure you got some really good advice from Yeah, from um, Doa too, Doa, he gave yeah. me some good advice as well. So. Um, everybody was, you know, more than happy to give me their perspective on, you know, what I did well. And I would be like, okay, I, I, I understand I did that well, but tell me what I can do better. Cause sure. that for me, that's something like, I don't want people to just tell me that I did something well. I want them to tell me what I can do next time better. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I would love to get invited back. You know, it's nothing's nothing certain. You know, I, I went out there and I did the best job I could. If I only ever did that once, I wanted that to be the best you know, opportunity that I mm -hmm. like best version of what I was delivering uh, to be the part of the product. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I want to be able to help enhance any kind of siege thing that I'm doing, whether it's our team or whatnot, or the broadcast or whatever, I want to be able to enhance that experience for other viewers. It's like the same reason why I wanted to work on the siege, like work on our own siege formula uh, or rating yeah. and have pros buy into it and say, this is, this is better. Um, I want to be able to have other things and provide other things to say, like to get people excited and to have them buy into that there are other aspects that 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 are here to enjoy from Siege, mm. rather than just fo focusing on the negative all the time. So yeah. uh, for me, that was that was really tough. Um, if I get to go back at any point, you know, um, I'll know now what that prep looks like, so I'll be less stressed. Yeah, uh, it's probably it was, way less prep that you'd have. To, yeah, you were probably I, the most prepped guy there in the entire. Studio. I had okay. I had points on every team. I had one or two points on every team. Yeah, on nearly every map, for every matchup, and then I had general map points. I had two to three That's map insane. points, um, per side. Yeah, uh, I had I had burned myself out by the end of it, like trying to yeah. figure all of that out. It was just the wrong kind of prep. Um, but I feel like back when when I would do something similar when I was doing like baseball broadcasting or football broadcasting, you would do things similar and you would come with like whole stacks. Like we, we did all on paper and we printed yeah. stuff out for like the mm -hmm. TV booth. Um, but you would have all this information, but you kind of have to navigate on the fly, like which points are you going to pull from all of that yep. to build your storyline or build your case around the point you were talking about. Exactly. So it was like, you always wanted to have that level of prep just so you had it in case you needed it. But then you didn't always use it. And that, that, to me, that bothered me. Because like, I spent 15 <laughs> hours this week going over this matchup between these two teams. And I probably used, you know, three bullet points yeah. out of 100 that I had made. But yeah, I, I, probably, I, I probably used 10% of my prep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I just had way too much. Uh, and, yeah, because you have all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you have, especially our desk, it had three analysts on it yeah. plus a host. And they had stuff they wanted to get through. They had points they wanted to say. So I'm trying to riff off and not only add 
yes and their their information uh -huh. based on what I know and what I my, my own research was, but also find opportunities to you know where possible crack a joke, you know keep it light yeah, yeah. rather than just you know constantly berating people with stats because that would get boring <laughs> after a while, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think there's a balancing act between providing numbers and providing that you know. Uh, it's kind of like the old ethos, logos, pathos argument, right? You need to have like all those components in order to have that level of credibility. And so I wanted to be able to provide the numbers to show, yes, I know my stuff. Uh, I can talk about numbers. I can talk about strats. I can talk about executes, you know, but yeah. I can also crack a joke, you know, with somebody. I can, I can you know, uh, offer a challenge to somebody. I can make something, uh, you know, add, add a little like edge to the, to the, to the desk, right? So I think that for me is like you're trying to balance all that stuff you're trying to balance people in your ear the cameras like you said uh it's, it's it was definitely a lot and i definitely yeah. i enjoyed it it was but it was hard work man it was yeah it was so hard <laughs> dude you leave and your brain is just exhausted yeah I yeah you're like mentally drained bed, yeah. yeah yeah the entire day cool well we gotta wrap up soon but before we go who's gonna win phase or a you know, we're at a EU home crowd. I would love to say Rogue, but having played FaZe, you know. Yeah, you think so? They're, they're nasty, man. Like, yeah. I, I think Rogue will get a map. I think they'll probably win like an one overtime map. Um, it'll, so it'll still be close. But I think one overtime map goes to Rogue. I think the other three go to FaZe and Regulation, and FaZe takes it 3-1. That's my prediction. 3-1. Yeah. There you, there, you, uh, there you have it. I guess we'll have to wait and see. I mean, everybody else will know. But Yeah, yeah. everyone will know by the end of it. But, you know, if you make it to the end of this podcast... <laughs> Which no one first. does. Uh, our viewer <laughs> retention is terrible on these. Yeah, so. well. Oh, well. Um, cool. All right, before we finish, thoughts on Berlin. Have you done anything fun outside of going to the venue, watching games? I own Berlin on yeah. the bird scooters, man. True. This uh, guy in the, in the bird scooters. I am flying around <laughs> Berlin on birds. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, we've, we've done a bunch of landmarks. Yeah. Um, I've eaten a bunch. I've had two different donor kebabs. I'm probably going to get a third one before I go. All right. Bad, um, bad. Yeah, it's just a fun city to drive around and, and, and walk around. And there's a lot of history here. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. And just being able to just read up on it and, you know, walk through it and kind of put yourself in, in the shoes of like what was happening at the time is mm -hmm. uh, pretty incredible. Because, you know, Philadelphia has history, but it's not like... It was like 250 years ago, and it yeah. was like some dude like signed a document. So. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like oh, there's a crack in this bell. Like yeah, that's kind of cool. Sick. Um, but yeah, it's something else when like you go to a country where you know it's not it's not a part of your history that you've yeah. grown up studying the entire time. Right. You know of it because of world history, but it's like you get to learn so much more into the stories. I think the uh, like especially the checkpoint Charlie for between East mm. and West Berlin. Like uh, just reading the stories about how people were crossing the the, the, the wall illegally just to get to right. West Berlin. Crazy. He had that guy who had 15 seconds to make it, and he drove a truck full of sand yeah, through dude, in nine it. seconds <laughs> with his wife and kid to make it to West Berlin. Yeah. And then they were just like, "Well, we can't do anything now." Yeah. Um, that guy's incredible. That guy's a hero. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of cool stories to see and kind of in, and just enjoy and the history. You know, celebrate the cool things that happened and then kind of like mourn the the sad things that happened and as you know there's a lot of both so uh just being able to look around the city and experience that and also just eat the food yeah <laughs> i think something about the history that you talked about that i think is interesting is how it's kind of been incorporated into just the city itself like for they sure have, yeah. like the the line where the wall was running throughout the whole city yeah they've left portions of the wall up throughout the whole city yep there's so many monuments that you can see and plaques and, and things like that. So it's well, how the roads too, you, the roads have the space right. where, where all the, the no man's land was in between. Mm -hmm. And so like there's, there's no buildings, there's no trees where that no man's land right. is. It's just streets now, yeah. which is incredible. Whereas like in Philly, it's like, okay, if you want to see the history, you got to go to this museum, pay 25 bucks to get in. Everything's and, a one way street all over the place. Yeah. It's like, can't, can't and that's it. Like it's yeah. all contained in this one area. Um, so yeah, that's been cool. Great. Well, We've almost hit the hour mark at this point. Right. Um, we we got to go go watch some Siege before we fly back tomorrow. Any final parting words? Where can people find you? Where can people keep keep up to date on uh, what Joe Bro's doing? Yeah, so you can follow me at uh, at Joe Brokeby on uh, on Twitter. It's like it's like Dokeby, but with Joe Bro and friend. <laughs> uh, and uh, you can also do that on on Twitch, which hopefully I, I want to start Twitch streaming. But that's kind of dependent on Ubisoft right now, if I can do that. Hey, man, stream your plat ranked games. Who cares? My, my plat ranked games, nobody wants to I'll see. I'll watch. Uh, but, I wish you know, you get dominated by uh, uh, 
a cheater or two. Yeah, well, it happens every every night. <laughs> every game. Okay. And it's like every other game. I, I get three or four <laughs> cheaters a night, man, at this point. And, you know, I'm like, that guy's cheating. My friends are like, is he, though? And I'm just like, He's che- I've never seen somebody do this in a VOD. I've never seen <laughs> my guys do this in scrims. It's not, it's not I possible. I know more than you, yeah. Yeah, no, no, one, no one would do this at a plat level. It's yeah. like, that guy knows too much. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, Joe broke be on, uh, Twitter on Twitch, hopefully soon. If Ubisoft ever gets back to me and, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. I don't have an Instagram. <laughs> I don't have a TikTok. That's right. Um, you have, you're verified on Twitter. I am verified so on Twitter. That's the yep. most important thing. That is true. I did the right way. True. You did the real way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm unverified. Yeah. Cause I, I don't, I, I won't do the right way or the wrong way. So. <laughs> you just don't care. I don't care. <laughs> I should probably try, but. Yes, yeah. you're not going to verify me. Right. Um, okay. Well, that's a wrap, guys. Thank you for, for tuning in. Leave your comments. We'll read it next video. But until next time, enjoy your day. Peace.